In this episode, we're going to talk about the Russian Revolution and Trotsky's participation in those events. This series will have new episodes every week. Subscribe to our channel to receive notifications. The Russian Revolution was the most important event in contemporary history. It was the first victorious socialist and workers' revolution which succeeded in consolidating its power, expropriating the bourgeoisie and building the first worker state in history. Even the degeneration of the Soviet state through the action of Stalinism and the restoration of capitalism that happened recently did not extinguish the enormous importance of that feat. Despite the fact it happened more than a hundred years ago, the repercussions of the enormous event of the Russian Revolution are present today. Just look at the obsession of the far right in raising the spectre of communism. Propus nessa semana o projeto de lei 5358 para proibir não só a foice e o martelo, como também a apologia ao comunismo. The big bourgeoisie media do the same. The concern of the enemies of the revolution shows how great is the importance of that event. Lenin was the outstanding leader of the Russian Revolution and after him was Trotsky. The history of Trotsky's political life is intimately linked to the history of the revolution. In 1905, Trotsky chaired the first Soviet, that is, the Council of Workers' Deputies, which was formed in Petrograd. Twelve years later, in the 1917 revolution, he returned as chairperson of the same Soviet and in the same city. But Trotsky was not only a great leader of the Russian Revolution. He was also the leading historian of that great event. Here we have his major work on the revolution. History of the Russian Revolution, which is a fantastic book. It is the only book on the history of a revolution that was written by one of its main protagonists. In the preface to the book, Trotsky sets out his views on the main features of the revolution. He says, The most indubitable feature of a revolution is the direct interference of the masses in historical events. And the history of a revolution is for us, first of all, a history of the forcible entrance of the masses into the realm of rulership over their own destiny. In the first chapter, Trotsky explains the peculiarities of Russia's development on the grounds of what he calls the law of uneven and combined development. Russia was an extremely unequal country. On the one hand, it was a rural country with very backward characteristics. For example, it had 80% illiteracy. But at the same time, it was a country where large modern industries had developed, the most modern in Europe, with a high concentration of the working class. This inequality was combined in a very contradictory socio-economic structure. At the same time, the country was ruled by a monarchical dictatorship, the Tsars of the Romanov family, who had absolute power and ruled in an absolutist manner. That is, it was a dictatorship. In 1905, these contradictions exploded after Russia's defeat in the Russian-Japanese War. The first revolution broke out, which was called by Trotsky a dress rehearsal. The revolutionary process began when the Tsar ordered a peaceful demonstration to be fired upon 
and more than a thousand workers were killed during that day. It was called Bloody Sunday. And believe it or not, this demonstration was led by a priest, Father Gapon, and it simply demanded better living and working conditions. For that alone, more than a thousand workers lost their lives. After Bloody Sunday, the workers' revolt was immense, and hundreds of strikes broke out over several months. In Petrograd, councils of workers' representatives that arose that tried to coordinate these strikes and organise them. But these same councils gradually took on the tasks of a parallel power. Trotsky was the first president of this Soviet, and he was only 25 years old. In December 1905, an insurrection of the Moscow workers broke out. This insurrection was again drowned in blood by Tsarist troops. More than a thousand workers were killed again. The revolution was pushed back, affecting the Bolshevik party. Lenin had been, since the turn of the century, preparing to build a democratically centralised party that could lead the working class in the revolution a party capable of resisting repression and at the same time building itself deeply rooted in the workers' movement. Lenin continued to organise the party during the years of retreat from 1905 to 1912. Trotsky's biggest mistake was not seeing the importance of the Revolutionary Party. He took an equidistant position from the Mensheviks and Bolsheviks during all those years until 1917. Trotsky made a self-criticism of all his previous period of centrism and finally joined the Bolshevik party, together with the group he led, which was the Inter-District Group. The outbreak of World War I in 1914 raised tensions within Russian society to an extreme. Russia's participation in the war alongside Britain and France led to the collapse of society, the state, the Russian army, and even the Tsarist regime. The Russian army suffered 11 million casualties, both dead and wounded. The fields ceased to be cultivated and hunger reached the cities. A celebration of Working Women's Day led to a series of strikes and demonstrations that lasted six days. After that, the Tsar was forced to resign. It was the democratic revolution that overthrew this dictatorship. After the fall of the Tsar, the workers reorganised the Soviets. However, these Soviets at first were led by the reformist left, Mensheviks and revolutionary socialists. And these organisations had the conception of handing over power to a coalition of the bourgeoisie with remnants of the old aristocracy. The first provisional government was formed, headed by a prince, Prince Lvov, and a broad coalition that included bourgeois parties such as the cadets and also some social democratic opportunist leaders such as Kerensky. From then on, in the following eight months until the October Revolution, there were several governments of coalition of bourgeois parties with reformist parties as the Mensheviks and the revolutionary socialists. The Mensheviks justified this decision to support or participate in governments of class conciliation of the bourgeoisie and the workers' organisations by saying that the revolution should stop in its democratic stage and it was the bourgeoisie who should rule. Even the Bolsheviks fell into this position and supported the provisional government during the first two months of the revolution. Lenin arrives in April and completely changes the policy of the Bolshevik party. He writes his famous April thesis, in which he states that the Bolsheviks must on no account support the provisional government, and that they must begin to insist that the Soviets take power into its own hands. The various provisional governments which succeeded one another in the course of those eight months did not solve a single one of the problems of the masses. They didn't stop the war. On the contrary, yielding to pressure from England and France, they tried to maintain an offensive of the Russian army. They didn't distribute land to the peasants and provoked great dissatisfaction in the countryside. 
they don't solve the problem of the oppressed nationalities within the Russian state. Nor did they convene the constituent assembly which was a demand of the whole population. After all, the contradictions aggravated more and more. Hunger threatens the entire working class and the population of the cities. The Bolsheviks advocated that the Soviets, which already constituted a parallel power, should take into their own hands the resolution of these tasks. That is why they raised the famous slogan, Bread, Peace and Land, and combined it with the demand for all power to the Soviets. In September, the Bolsheviks won a majority of representatives in the Petrograd Soviet and elected Trotsky its chairman. Eventually, in October, the Petrograd Soviet, now led by the Bolshevik Party, organised an insurrection that overthrew the Kerensky government and seized power. The next day, this action was ratified by the All-Russian Congress of Soviets. The October Revolution, which was consciously led by a revolutionary party, raises a question. In the end, what is a socialist revolution? In general, the socialist revolution is the passage of political power of the state from the hands of the bourgeois class to the working class by means of a mass insurrection. The proletariat destroy the bourgeois institutions and build new institutions out of the power of the workers' councils that were already being organised. This new state power, which is much more democratic than any bourgeois democracy, took the most urgent measures to solve the problems of the working masses. It stopped the war, solved the problem of hunger, distributed land to the peasants, and not by chance these were the first degrees of the Bolshevik-led Soviet government. But the new Soviet government did not stop at these emergency measures. Faced with sabotage and the flight of big business, the government expropriated all large ownership of the means of production, factories, banks and big business. These were the first steps towards the socialization of the economy, followed by economic planning and the monopoly of foreign trade. I'd like to thank everyone who have watched this video and who has been following our series. In the next episode, we'll deal with two topics. The workers' councils, that is the Soviets, and the socialization of the economy, the first steps of the nascent Soviet Republic.